Hi there everyone, it's been a while since we did the White Gloves of Destiny where I shut my eyes and do a lucky dip into the Royal Society card catalogue here. I will point out the Royal Society does have a computerised catalogue. We do. Let's see what I find. Alright Keith, I'm going to go... I'm going to go up a bit higher, I'm going to go up here. I'm going to go towards the back and about here. You have a meteorological archive. Well, there we go. George A. Martin, Hourly Meteorological Observations at Ventnor. Yeah, so that's a big long list of rainfall and, and sunshine measurements, I think. So not that exciting, Brady. It's OK, because as you know, we always do what I like to call the mm. provisional, where I do a second pick if the first pick ends up being too boring. Let's see if I get lucky with my second one. OK, I'm going to go... I'm going to stay down this end, but a bit lower. And... Mm, Let's go here, and I'm going to go about about here. What have we got? Cromwell Mortimer, a further account with a description of the mosaic pavement formerly in the Temple of Fortune at Keith Help. Preneste. Preneste. So 1737. We like a pavement, don't we? <laughs> well, <laughs> it wouldn't be my first choice, but you yeah. never know. The gloves have spoken. Keith left the keys upstairs. All right, so Keith, this is the meteorological archive. That's right, so these are weather records from all over the world. Every time the Royal Society sent out an expedition somewhere, they would record temperature, humidity, wind, other observations. So this is a historical record of climate. I've got some great things in here. This one is from Port Jackson, 1788. So this is probably the first scientific record from any resident in Australia. So this kept by William Dawes, who was a, a lieutenant of Marines. All right, so there we go, Port well, you, Jackson. You didn't pick that, Brady, I'm afraid. No, I didn't pick no, that you one. you didn't pick that one. We'll put got, it away. Keith, you strike me as a bit of someone who would be like a weather buff. Do you, are you one of those people who in their backyard has one of those weather stations and keeps all the... No. <laughs> really? No, 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 absolutely not. I'll take your word for it. Okay. But we're, we want George A. Martin, MA110. That's the okay. one that I picked out. That's where... right. So that's around the corner. Oh, wow. Oh, there we go. And you can see MA110 to 118. Okay. I'll take the box. There it is. Let's unbox these treasures. Here we are. As promised, MA110 is on top. The suspense. Here we go. It's considerable. We've got a letter which starts with Dear Sir, and that's about the end of my ability to read this. So this is sent from Belgrave House in Ventnor, and it's March 25th. 1842. So it's a covering letter, my dear sir. According to my promise, I give you the enclosed for its accuracy. I can vouch the only parties concerned in making the observations being myself and brother. I regretted I had not previously got a barometer which would have agreed with yours about sending for that which he had sent to you and had hoped. Well, so basically, he's talking about a barometer. They, don't, they never really get to the point. Do no, they? they don't. No, yeah. no, no. Here's what's been sent. So he sent this to Robertson, who's uh, one of the secretaries, assistant secretaries at the Royal Society. Ventnor is on the Isle of Wight, so that's where the weather record comes from. Oh, okay. And you can see what he's recording here. So we have <laughs> hourly records of the yep. barometer, the thermometer, the wind direction, yep. and the weather explained in a little pricey. So he's put a few weather comments on there, yeah. <laughs> It feels like he planned to like start this incredible weather record, yep. and after two or three days he went, I think I'll send this to the Royal Society now, that's enough. Yeah, that'd be enough, but there's some, <laughs> some general barometer comments on here as well, I see. The barometer and attendant thermometer are placed in a hall at a distance of about six feet from the ground, and are but little acted on by artificial temperature. Well, that's good practice, but pretty standard. Well, Keith... If anyone ever comes to the Royal Society and says, Mr. Moore, I really need to know what the weather was like on the Isle of Wight on September 21, 1842, you're going to be able to say, you're in luck, my friend. Weirdly, I've been asked similar questions. Maybe our second White Gloves of Destiny will be a little bit more interesting. Shall we see what well, that one's we, like? we can try. We can try. So we're looking for RBC, which is the Register Book Copy, Volume 20. So, Register Book Copy, 20. Register book copy, 20. Alright, 
295. A further account with the description of the mosaic pavement formerly in the Temple of Fortune at Trieste. Where's that? Presumably somewhere in Italy, I right. would think. So Cromwell Mortimer was a secretary of the Royal Society. He's interested in antiquarian matters as well as straightforwardly scientific ones. So this this falls into that category. Do you just Should know that off the top of your head? Or uh, yeah. He's, he's, yeah. Okay. Um, so oh, I knew too. I was just checking if you did. Uh, yeah, I got that's, yeah, that's good. So here we have nice, straightforward, fair copy handwriting. Yeah. Uh, so you can cope with this very well, Brady. To the two foregoing opinions concerning the sub-represented yeah. in this mosaic pavement. Short, short for subject. Oh, represented right. in this mosaic pavement. Here's whether it is designed to represent the expedition of Alexander the Great yeah. <laughs> up the Nile. Please tell me there's going to be a picture of this mosaic. When he went to visit the Temple of Jupiter. I shall add the opinion of Suvasius in his Prynesti. So he's quoting classical authors. Book one of this particular publication. Keith, Keith, I've picked a boring one, haven't I? Well, it's not great. We, we could maybe get a picture. If there's a picture, everything will be rescued. But, all oh, right, so now he's listing like... He's describing what's on this pavement. I mean, if this is such a famous pavement, maybe James is going to be able to find a picture of it later and I show I think people. we should be able to find something. So the first objects which present themselves to our view are two crocodiles, emblems of the River Nile, one lying on a green grassy island with a typha palustris growing upon it, which are here represented in seeds as a plant with their cat's tails. Under this is another crocodile just plunging into the water. Over these is a hippopotamus. I'd like to see this paper. Yeah, it sounds no, great. He's, he's like, yeah. um, he's literally painting a picture with a thousand words. He is, yes, yeah. So he goes into like incredible detail of every image that can be found all the way along this mosaic pavement. Gosh, it goes on a bit. This is a big pavement, Brady. It's a good pavement to pick, I have to say. This is a good choice. I'm getting quite excited now. We've got bits of, looks like we've got some Greek writing now. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Wow. Oh, hang on, the end is nigh. So there we go, 35 pages. You'd it, like there to be an illustration <laughs> right there, wouldn't you? It, uh, we, get, we do 35 <laughs> pages of writing. I have to say, not a bad choice. I mean, this is... Not a bad choice. There's no pictures. Half of it's in Latin. Well, we tend to think of Egyptology as being a very 20th century thing. But of course, the earlier generations were interested in this kind of thing. There was an Egyptian society in Britain in the 18th century. And presumably Cromwell Mortimer is part of that very early movement to try and understand this kind of artifact. So early archaeology, good stuff. OK, well, there we go. I think the main thing that I've learned today is that it's usually best to let Keith decide what objectivity videos should be about. But sometimes you gotta let the gloves have their say. Mm. Here we see the book and there are no answers in the back of the book. You have to figure it out yourself. And this is one of the delightful aspects of being in a frontier. It's a place where your normal intuition does not apply. It's a place that's rich in discovery and the answers are not in the back of the book. This is the first time we've had an astronaut, a man who has spent 370 days of his life in space. Could we possibly have had two better choices? It's extraordinary.